Greetings, hello again. It has been 56 days since we last gathered as a church, and this is not something we can afford to get used to. The church must meet. We, we must meet. As Christians, we do not believe in being only concerned about physical safety as if that somehow means that we must sacrifice the gathering of the church in order to be safe, or that we cannot gather in a way that emphasizes physical safety and gathering. Well, we, we believe we can do both. And so please, please pray for us as elders as we seek the Lord in these really uh, difficult matters. And above all, pray that we would gather as a church next Lord's Day. Now today we want to look at God's Word as it is found to us in 2 Corinthians 5 verses 1 to 10. If you've been following in the, along in the last number of weeks, you will know that we've been walking through 2 Corinthians chapter 4. In verses 7 to 15, we saw that God appoints us to afflictions so that his glory might be seen in us. And we saw that we have this glorious promise that after this life of affliction is over, we will be raised with Christ and with all of Christ's people. Then last week in verses 16 to 18, we saw that not only does the glory or is the glory to come so much better than this present affliction that it's not even worth comparing, but we also saw that, that this present suffering is actually increasing our future glory. And we, we were called to look not to what is seen, but to what is unseen. Today we turn to the next passage. Just following along in chapter 5, verses 1 to 10, as we see Paul now expand on the hope of the resurrection. He's going to explain and unpack this hope of the resurrection a little bit. So let's, let's read 2 Corinthians 5, verses 1 to 10, and this is the word of the Lord. For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God. A house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling, if indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage. We would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So, whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please Him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Let's pray as we begin. Lord, we pray earnestly that you would have us meet next week. Lord, grow in our hearts a uh, desire to meet. Lord, if we're growing weary in this desire, Lord, inflame this desire in our hearts, that we would just eagerly desire to uh, come together as a church and that you would enable us to happen. We pray now as we look at your word, Lord, and we look at these glorious promises of future resurrection, Lord. We pray that you would give us understanding and most of all, Lord, that you would give us this certain hope, that you would give us a, a vision, Lord, for what you have for us, what you have planned for us, and what is ours in Christ. And may it shape our lives every day. Amen. We want to start with this question, what is the hope that is offered to us in Christ? What is our hope as Christians? How would you answer that? It might actually be harder for us to answer than we expect. We often summarize the gospel something like this. We say, Jesus died for our sins so that if we repent and we put our trust in, in Christ alone, we will be forgiven, we will be cleansed, and we will be reconciled to God. And that is absolutely true, and that is a, a perfectly good summary of the gospel. 
But what is the point of forgiveness? What, what is the point of cleansing and being reconciled to God? What, what is the central purpose and the central promise of the gospel that ought to function as the foundation for our souls as we walk through this life full of sufferings and trials? What is our final hope? What's the final destination? Where is it all going? Well, our final hope is summarized well in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 14. We've been looking at that the last few weeks. Paul says there, Knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. This is the hope. And there's three components. There's physical resurrection. Just as Christ was raised physically, he walked out of the grave, so we will be raised physically in the same way. The second component is that we will be raised together. Uh, Paul says, he will bring us with you into God's presence. And that leads us then to the third component. We will be together forever in resurrected bodies in the presence of God. It, it's in his presence. This is the hope to which we have been called. Resurrection from the dead with God's people in the presence of God forever that's what forgiveness is for. Forgiveness is necessary so that instead of being raised for judgment, we can be raised for life. Cleansing us so that we, instead of being shut out of the, the blessed presence of God forever because of our defilement of our sin, we can instead be, be cleansed and brought into his glorious presence without stain or blemish to enjoy him forever. This is our hope. And in, in chapter 5 now, verses 1 to 10, which we just read, Paul's going to unpack for us the hope of this resurrection and how this can shape our lives today. So we're going to look at five main points. Our, our hope, our groan, our guarantee, our confidence, and our aim. Now, before we jump in, I want to point out a few scriptures that that really highlight the need to understand what this hope is. First one I want to look at is Ephesians verse, uh, chapter 1, verses 16 to 18. Paul says, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know, here it is, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. So Paul says, I don't cease praying for you, church, why? That God would open your eyes to, to show you the hope that he's called you to. He says, I, I want God to show you that hope. And what this means is that he assumes that the Christians he's writing to need to grow in their understanding of what the hope that they have is. M maybe they're forgetting. Maybe, maybe they were misinformed. They, they need to know this hope. Struggling to have a clear picture of our hope of future glory is indeed an ongoing struggle in the church, and we need to be reminded. And then 1 Peter 1, 13, Paul uh, Peter says, Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, listen to this command, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So Peter under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says, set your hope fully on this future glory. Fully, he says. The, the promise of resurrection with Christ in God's presence forever must be the, the singular hope of our hearts. The singular hope. Any mixture of hope in the betterment of circumstances in this life will be damaging to our souls. Our hope must be fully set on the grace of future glory when we are resurrected with Christ. And so with that, let, let's go in and, and let's, let's look here at this future hope, at this future glory. So point number one, our hope. I'm just going to look at what the hope is. Our, our hope is being raised from the dead in new glorified 
bodies. Look at verse 1. For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Now, how do we know he's talking about a physical body when he's talking about the tent and the building? Well, we know because in in chapter 4, verse 10, he talked about carrying around the death of Christ in our bodies. In chapter 4, verse 14, he said that he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also raise us from the dead. So Jesus' resurrection was physical resurrection. He could he could be touched, he ate food, he could be seen, and our resurrection will be the same. It'll be physical. The body. And in chapter five, verse eight, Paul says to be away from the body is to be with Christ. And so the topic he's he's speaking of here is bodily resurrection. So why does he talk about tents and buildings? Well why does he use this metaphor? Well, we can understand it when we, when we consider the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, the, the people of God were, were wandering in the wilderness, and, and God dwelt with them in a tabernacle. A, a tabernacle is simply a, a tent. It, it was transportable. It was temporary. Now, when the people of God went into the land, eventually Solomon w- would build a temple not made of tent things, but made with stone and and gold. And the glory of this temple that Solomon built was was renowned. The whole world knew about the glory of the temple. Foreign kings would come to marvel at its beauty. But nobody comes to marvel at a tabernacle. It's just a tent. Now Paul uses this comparison to describe our, our current physical bodies in relation to our future glorious physical bodies. He says, for we know that if the tent, that is our earthly home, bodies, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. So here's what he's saying. He's saying our, our bodies are like a tent. These bodies, the ones you see here, that you have, they are temporary. They are prone to weakness. Back in, in chapter 4, verse 7, he said, our, our bodies are like jars of clay. They're, they're given to affliction and perplexity and persecution and, and being struck down. Now, this doesn't mean that we should despise our bodies and say our bodies are, are, are evil. The, the tabernacle, which was a tent, contained the presence of God as surely as the temple did. And, and our physical bodies are, are created by God for His good purposes and by the Spirit. He dwells in our physical bodies even today, even in our corrupted bodies. But Paul recognizes in the fallen world, these physical bodies will fail us and they will die. And Paul says when they fail us and when they die, we will one day have a, a building from God. New bodies are coming. And, and he says, this building from God, these new bodies, are not made with hands. That is, our resurrection bodies are, are created by, by God. They're, they're achieved by, by God. They're not something that we have earned with our efforts or with our works. It is a new creation work of the grace of God. And, and he says, this building is eternal in the heavens. It cannot be destroyed. It's guarded by God. It's it's incorruptible. Now you might notice he he says we have this building. Present tense. We have a building from God, and 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 he speaks this way not because we are already resurrected in our bodies because we're not, but we we have it today already by faith. Although we live in these earthly tents, the future resurrection is so certain that. It's as though we already have it. It's there. It's waiting for us. And and this is our hope. These these bodies will will die. The ultimate disappointment in life is, and the ultimate loss in this present world is physical death. In physical death, we lose all our money. We lose our family. We lose our work. We lose our earthly treasures. Everything is gone in that instant. You don't take anything with you. And if we live for the things that belong to this earthly tent, death is an absolute and total loss. And this is probably part of the reason why the world we live in right now is is consumed with the fear of death. Because if we die physically and that's all we have, we lose everything. 
but not if we have a better hope. And so Paul's hope is that even though we lose everything that belongs to this body, even though the earthly tent is destroyed, a better hope of a better body is coming. Death is not final. Resurrection is coming. That's the hope of the gospel. So let's look at point two. We looked at our hope, now we look at our groan. Our groan. When, when we live in this earthly tent, we, we groan. Look at verses 2 to 4 with me. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling, if indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, again, we groan, being burdened. Not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now, let's notice two main things here. The first is that in this life, there is groaning. We, we groan. As we live in this earthly tent that is passing away, we groan, don't we? The life is full of sufferings and, and trials. And Paul says, that's normal Christian life. If you're a Christian and your life is full of groaning, don't take that to mean that you're a bad Christian. Our lives will be marked by joy as Christians, and, and it's joy, especially in this future hope. But it doesn't mean that we don't at the same time groan. We're, we're sorrowful yet always rejoicing. And our groan isn't just a groan of suffering. It's a groan of longing. It's a groan of longing. The, the groan in the soul of a Christian isn't just to be free from trials. But it's also to enter in into this glory of the resurrection. Paul says we're longing to put on the heavenly dwelling. We long for the resurrection. And if you're still in doubt as to whether Paul is talking about physical resurrected bodies, listen to what he says in Romans 8, 23. This is the same language. He says, not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly, as we wait eagerly for adoption of sons, the redemption of our bodies. So what are we groaning for? We are groaning for the redemption of our bodies. We long for the day when our bodies won't grow sick and die, and when they won't tempt us to sin. We, we groan for the resurrection. And so secondly, and related to that, we want to notice that Paul's hope is not in being a disembodied soul. This, this is not Paul's hope. There's a very common belief among Christians today that, that when we die, our, our bodies go in the dirt and our souls go to be with Jesus. And that's true, but they say, that's it. Our bodies stay in the dirt and our souls are with Jesus and that's eternity. Disembodied spirits floating around in a place we called heaven and we say, that's our final destination. And, and that's not the biblical picture. Paul says that he is burdened not to be unclothed, not to be disembodied, but to be further clothed so that what is mortal, that this body may be swallowed up by the resurrection. The Corinthians had a lot of cultural tendencies that we have. Because of their philosophy of the day, they tended to view the body as, as evil or, or throwaway. The body was thought to be an unnecessary evil that, that we shed upon death. And, and finally, when we die, we're free to live the way we were supposed to live. That is, without a body. And, and that's the th common thought today, is that the body is just a shell that holds in the, the real us. But this is not Paul's view, and Paul's hope is not to be disembodied. Now, it is true that when Christians die, our souls go immediately to be with the Lord. And we're going to look at that. Uh, just a few verses later. But that is not the final destination. This is not our final hope. There's coming a day when Christ returns and, and brings with him the souls of the departed and they will rise again in new, glorified, physical, heavenly bodies. It says what is mortal will be swallowed up by life. Swallowed up by life. Isn't that a beautiful image? Uh, think of our bodies. We, we are, they're fallen. They're, they're part of this fallen world. They get sick. They get injured. They wear out. And 
Our bodies war against us, don't they? The spirit is willing, but the flesh is, is weak. Do you notice how much of a spiritual war it is to get your feet out of bed, to go find your Bible and sit down and stay awake while you hear the word of God? Your body's warring against you. And the body says it's much easier to lie down in front of a TV than to get up and love your neighbor. The body tells us that, that the body's sexual desires must be met, even if we have to sin to, to do it. And our, our bodies get hungry. And what happens? Immediately our patience with our spouse or with our children or with one another is diminished. Isn't it exciting to think of the day when a body of eternal life will replace and will swallow up this body of death? Can you imagine a body that isn't fighting against the desires of the Spirit in your heart, but is working in perfect unity with the Spirit? How long can you worship together with the saints? So Sunday morning we're worshiping, we're, we're singing, we're praying, we're listening to the Word. How long can we do this? How long can we endure in our bodies? Maybe an hour and a half? Then our brain gets tired, our, our back gets sore. We get sleepy, we, we start, oh, I wonder what's for lunch. But imagine the, the most precious, joyful time of worship that you've ever experienced with the saints. And then imagine that in a body that can do that forever without weariness, without limit. How glorious is that new body? This is what we have to look forward to. And, and, now we, we, we groan for it. We, we groan in longing for this to come. It leads us to third point, our guarantee. Our guarantee. Verse 5. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who's given us the Spirit as a guarantee. Uh, again, we're reminded that, that God is the author of this great hope. This is not something that we are achieving by good works or by just... Uh, empty optimism. This is a promise of God. God is preparing us for this very thing. And it says, He has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. This is a very common theme in, in the New Testament. The, the Holy Spirit is the guarantee of what is to come. To be the guarantee is to be a, a down payment or a deposit or a pledge. Uh, the verse we read earlier from Romans said, he, He's the first fruits of what is to come. When God comes to us, when we, when we first believe he, he, he gives us spiritual life and He gives us the presence of the Holy Spirit to dwell in our hearts. And not only does the Holy Spirit give us new desires and a new love for Christ and a, a new hatred for sin, but He is also, His very presence is the beginning of the new creation in us. When the Holy Spirit of Christ comes into us, we are already now participating in the new creation. We have already begun to be renewed into the image of Christ. And His presence with us is our guarantee. He's going to finish the job. He, he's going to bring us all the way through into the resurrection. This is what Paul says in Romans 8.11. He says, If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, then he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So if the, if the spirit raised Christ from the dead, led him out of the grave in a body that will never die again, and if that spirit lives in you, then he who raised Christ will raise you from the dead and lead you out of the grave and, and your body will never die again. That is the hope that we have in Christ. And that leads us to point four, our confidence. Our confidence. Look at verses six to eight. So we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. This word, to be, to be of good courage, is most often translated in the New Testament as confidence. We have, we have confidence. That is, because the Holy Spirit is 
in us and he's the guarantee of the resurrection to come, we have confidence as we live our lives. It's not confidence in us, but it's confidence that God will do what he has promised. We will be raised on the final day. And then Paul says two statements here. He says, we know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. And he says we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So what he's not saying here is that our hope is actually not in the resurrection. He's not changing his story. Instead, he's saying that before the resurrection, he would rather be away from the fallen body of death and be at home with the Lord. For Paul to to die is gain because to die is to be with Christ. So today, when people die in Christ, their, their souls go to be with the Lord. This is a beautiful truth. When our saints, who are, who are dear to us, when they pass away, we, we grieve, but, but not for them. Because they are with the Lord. Now, they're not yet raised. Their, their body, we see it, it goes into the ground. But their souls are with Christ. And they have left behind the struggles and sins of the world, and they are at home with the Lord. And then Paul says something really important here. He says, we walk by faith and not by sight. We walk by faith and not by sight. That's a familiar theme. In a few verses earlier, in chapter 4, verse 18, he said, we need to look not to what is seen, but to what is unseen. That's the same thing. That's to walk by faith, not by sight. You see, by faith we possess the hope of the resurrection because of Christ. By faith we live our lives for a city whose builder is God. By faith, we place all our hope in the future glory that we don't see with our eyes. This is what the Christian life is. We live our our lives for the hope that we don't see, not for the consequences that we do see and the circumstances that we do see. Doesn't it seem to you that this world is falling apart and wasting away? That's just so pronounced right now. This, This world is so troubled. But it always has been. Ever since sin entered the world in in the garden, it's always been troubled. This is not something that started in the last few months, even though now we maybe have our eyes open to it. Now we're seeing what the world actually has always been. It's always been this earthly tent that is passing away. But we don't live by what is seen. We live by faith, and by faith we understand that Jesus is the king over every king. And that his kingdom will never pass away, and that he will return. He's going to judge the world. He's going to remove sin and death once and for all. And we will be raised with him to rule with him and and with one another. and, And in God's eternal kingdom forever. And that is our hope. And our hope is unchanging. The political structures of the world may change. Our hope is certain and constant and completely unchanged by anything going on in the world. So we get to point five now. We saw um, our confidence. Now we see our aim. So if we hope in heaven, we just sit around in little clusters wasting our lives until the resurrection comes? No. Look at verse 9. So whether we are home or away, we make it our aim to please him. Paul's applying this now to our lives. Whether we are with the Lord after death or away from him in this life, we make it our aim to please the Lord. Our, Our life has a purpose. There's a calling. It is to please the God who has achieved salvation for us. And so, Paul says, therefore, or so, we we make it our aim to please him. Because we have a great confidence, because we have a great hope, because we have the Holy Spirit as our guarantee, because of this, we aim to please God. We don't aim to please God to try to work off our sin or try to earn our salvation. We, We aim to please God because eternal life 
with him is guaranteed because of Christ and aiming to please this world is futile. That's a bad investment. And we also aim to please God because judgment is coming. Judgment is coming. Look at the rest of verse 10. For we aim to please God. For because we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. God's promise in Christ of future resurrection does not mean there's no judgment. The Bible is very clear. Everyone will appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Verse 10 says, We all, everyone, no exceptions, you and me, the Apostle Paul, Billy Graham, Donald Trump, Justin Trudeau, every single human being will appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And on that day, we will receive what is due for what we have done in the body, whether good or evil. That's what the verse says. Just in case you thought that because our hope is in the resurrection, therefore this body doesn't matter. Paul makes it clear to us. He says, what we do in this body will be repaid on the last day. What we do in this body will be repaid on the last day. This body matters. What we do with our bodies matter. The Corinthians had this idea that just because they said the body isn't really who we are, and they said, therefore we can we can keep going to prostitutes because that's just the body. That's not our soul. That's not us. It's just the body. Paul says, not so. It is the deeds done in the body that form the body of evidence that will be judged on the last day. And we want to make something clear, though. Legalistic works of the law to try to work our way into God's salvation is not what's talked about here. This is not what this is about. So what kind of works then are, are good and what kind of works are, are evil? Well, good works in the context here are that which flows out of our confidence in the hope that is to come. So when we believe that we'll be raised with Christ and, and all our hope is in, in that promise, and we gladly then sacrifice the pleasures of this world to please Christ because having Him on that day is more important to us than having the world, our lives, our works will demonstrate our faith and God will say, this is a good life. But when we don't believe the promises of God, when we cling to this world and we cling to the pleasures of the world, we live our lives in unbelief, our works will demonstrate our unbelief and God will call them evil. This is not a, a balancing of the scales where God takes all the good things we do and all the bad things we do and weighs them out in whatever way the needle points, heaven and hell. No, the, the whole of our life is, is in view. The whole of the life is described as good or, or as evil. There will be good, which is a life of imperfect and stumbling and yet true faith in Christ. Or there will be bad, which is a life of unbelief and God's promises and a striving for the promises of this world. So you would say, oh, what does it look like to live a life of confidence in the promise of the resurrection? What does that kind of life look like? Well, it looks like Paul's life. His confidence and his hope was only in the resurrection. And so what did he do? What kind of life did he have? Well, he proclaimed the gospel, even though it led him into prison. And then in prison, he kept proclaiming the gospel and converted the guards. And so he got out of prison. He kept preaching because even if he's imprisoned again, that's okay. He's going to be raised. And eventually he, he died for the proclamation of the gospel. But this is of no consequence to Paul because to die is gain. Because to die is to be with Christ. And when someone has confidence in the promises of God and a confidence in what is unseen instead of what is seen, they do things like that. They do things that are pleasing to God. So the question is, do you believe in the resurrection of the dead? 
Do you believe in that hope? I'm not asking, do you put a check mark beside that answer on a theology test? I'm asking, is your confidence in the resurrection of the dead? Is your hope set only on that grace that is to be revealed on the last day? Is that what you live for? Is your every thought of your mind and action of your body and intention of your heart directed toward and controlled by this blessed hope that controlled the Apostle Paul? I want to close by reading the purpose statement of Paul's life. It's found in Philippians chapter 3, verses 8 to 15. Listen here for his hope. What is his hope? You'll, you'll find it's, it's attaining the resurrection of the dead. And then listen for how that drives his life. We're going to read this now in closing. Philippians 3, 8 to, uh, 3, 8 to 15. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him in the power of of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings becoming like him in his death listen that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own brothers I do not consider that I have made it my own but one thing I do Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Application for us. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if anyone, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Let's pray. Lord, we ask that you would give us a vision for what is unseen. Lord, destroy our, our hope and our love for this, the things of this world. Lord, lift up the glory of what is to come, this glory of resurrection with Christ, with you, the Father, in heavenly places. Lord, may that hope be the single motivation of our lives. May this be our only hope so that we can gladly walk away from the things of this world and, and do hard things that we might please you, Lord, and be found in you on that last day. Amen. Thank you for watching. And Lord willing, we won't do it like this again. Lord willing, we'll meet in person soon.